Hi, and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm still your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, recording still from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about the rats of the Black Plague who got a bad rap, the tiniest but mightiest snot house of the sea, and a common house pet who was banned. Banned, I say, from Queensland, Australia. Ready? Let's go. Hello, everyone. I hope you're holding up okay. I'm recording this three days after the United States elections, and we still do not know who our next president is. But when you do hear this in about a month, it'll be after Thanksgiving, and hopefully the only choice that you're still making is how many slices of leftover pie you are going to eat. And this is going to look a lot different for many of you this holiday season. For us, it's the first time ever that our little family will be staying in one place, not traveling, likely, to see moms and dads and grandparents. And that feels really strange. This is my favorite holiday, the Thanksgiving going into Christmas season. And given COVID and the uncertainty of this election and everything else, it is very, very important to look at the things that are very important to you. And sometimes those things aren't traditions at all, but they're the things that you have right in front of you, right here, right now. And if you're feeling anxious or uncertain, lots of grown-ups are feeling that way too. And I'm telling you, as a grown-up, it's going to be okay. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it will be okay. And today we are going to cover three fascinating stories. In our last segment, a cute, fuzzy, adorable animal who is completely banned from Queensland, Australia's limits, as it's the most destructive and invasive species in the region. And it's not the birds who catch things on fire from episode 8. It's more destructive than that, if you can even imagine. And I would argue these animals are much cuter and hoppier. We're also going to talk about the tiniest and mightiest but most misnamed animal in the entire ocean who is trying to save our oceans with snot. But first... In the 1300s, a sudden, quote, black death went through Europe, apparently killing healthy people overnight. It all started when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked in Sicily, Italy, and those on the docks were met with a most horrific discovery. Most sailors aboard these ships were dead, and those who were still alive were gravely ill and covered in black boils that oozed blood and pus. Ick. These death ships were immediately ordered out of the harbor, but it was kind of too late. This introduced the plague into Europe, and over the next five years, the Black Death would kill more than 20 million people in all of Europe. That was almost a third of the continent's entire population. The rats on this ship have always been blamed for the outbreak. Rats traveled on these ships and were considered dirty vermin. But we have a big place in our hearts for rats on this show. As you remember the hero rat with the gold medal? right? We love rats. Apparently, the 1300s did not feel the same way. See, the plague never really ended, and it did return with a vengeance years later, but officials in the Venetian-controlled port of Ragusa were able to slow the spread of the plague by keeping arriving sailors in isolation until it was clear that they were not carrying the disease. Essentially, they were creating social distancing measures that relied on the isolation of people to slow the spread of a disease. So instead of being able to just make a quick stop at the store on shore and see some friends, these sailors were instead kept on the ships for a trantino, or 30 days. And this time frame was eventually increased to 40 days, or a quarantine. Those of us in the USA are still dealing with COVID-19 concerns might be very familiar with today right? But we also know a little more now about how diseases work and how they spread and precautions and yes, how they started. So remember how I said that the rats got a bad rap in all of this? Well, it turns out because the plague is still around in modern times. Uh-huh. 
We can still use science to figure out what mostly caused the outbreaks in the 1300s and... It wasn't the rats. It was us. <gasps> Twist! You see, we can study plagues like, yes, the Black Plague because there are still outbreaks of it today. And the Black Plague typically is spread to people when fleas who ate some of that tasty, tasty infected rat blood jump up and bite humans. And the theory is that when the rats had died, their flea ride-alongs got desperate with lack of food so they jumped onto humans. Ugh. Ew. And according to LiveScience.com, the Black Death spread much farther and faster and killed way more people than when the disease rears its ugly head today. Why is that? Well, it's speculated that fleas and lice, probably chewed up on earlier humans, were infected by the plague, jumped from human to human. And not only that's how it could have spread so fast, but the researchers went on to say that this method, human parasites jumping from person to person, was the primary method of the plague spreading around Europe, meaning more people likely got the Black Death from human parasites than the few who were initially infected by breathing in Black Death germies or from any rats that might have been thrown under the bus in a desperate yet effective marketing technique paid for by Big Parasite. My daughter is a huge fan of Wow in the World. It's a kid's science podcast hosted by NPR's Guy Raz and Mindy Thomas. You might have learned if you listened to that show that plastics are a problem. Animals who eat plastic, and there are a lot of them which we will discuss in a minute, but animals who eat plastic end up starving because they are eating plastic. And then those animals who feed on the animals who ate plastic also starve because they are also just eating plastic inside of another animal who has eaten plastic. It's basically a matryoshka doll of plastic badness, and it goes all the way up the food chain to our plate if you eat fish of any kind. So let's meet the creature who's doing what it can on a very small scale while we remain vigilant and educated on a larger scale. See, when I say giant larvation, do you picture a large serpent-like creature? Or maybe a fishy animal who's ugly, but you suspect that there's just more to him than his god-awful looks? You know in your soul that this giant, disgusting-looking creature is doing good things in the deep blue sea? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Are you perhaps imagining the giant larvation as something cute and huge just kind of bobbing around in the Atlantic? Prepare to be disappointed, everyone. While these creatures are called giant, the larvation is not any bigger than your pinky finger. And this plastic-picking plankton has a spinal cord but no backbone, and it is a pretty simple little creature. It also has a special feature. And unless you know about these animals, you might never have heard this term before, and I'm so sorry in advance if you have a weak stomach. These creatures have an unusual superpower called the mucus mansion. It's exactly what it sounds like. The mucus mansion is a goo box, gunk digs, juices joint, booger haven, slimed residence, snot house. The mucus mansion is literally a bubble the larvation creates around itself out of mucus, hack, spit, snot, for a house that it lives in. The mucus mansion can be up to three feet. All right, so let's look at this. Take an average sized three-year-old kid. They are in the ballpark of about three feet tall. Now take your pinky finger and compare the two. The larvation is the pinky and the three-year-old is the size of the mucus mansion. These larvations make bubbles out of mucus as big as a three-year-old child. No, 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 no. And this mansion is to protect themselves, the pinky finger, from the watery world around them. Ew. But the mucus also filters out food, just like our bodies filter out or eventually poop out what it doesn't need. This mucus filters out plastic, especially microplastics. Now, microplastics are getting a ton of conversation in the news now as they are big in beauty products and lots of things we purchase. And most of these teeny tiny plastics float to the top of the ocean, and they appear like small prey for animals who eat things like bugs, plankton, fish, eggs, or in bigger cases, plastic grocery bags might look like jellyfish, food for sea turtles. 
And while we think that these bigger plastics like grocery bags or bread bags as a bigger problem, and they are, the biggest issue right now are these microplastics, less than five millimeters in length. And they are swallowed up by the smallest members in the food chain, and they go all the way to the top, causing blockages, poisoning, starvation. It's all bad, 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 bad. But researchers love the larvation because they are see-through. And when they eat things they're supposed to eat, or in the case of plastic, not supposed to eat, it doesn't leave much to the imagination to scientists. You see? They're see-through. Get it? They can see everything. The larvation comes through the water, picks up the suspected food particles, and its snot house basically filters everything. They are a filter feeder. And once the plastic is confirmed by the larvation as not food, it goes the way of all things that are not food. Out the poop chute. Larvation poop then falls to the ocean floor. And it's believed here that these amazing tiny giant larvations transport these microplastics, tiny beads and face scrubs, all of it, along with a third of the carbon in the ocean. Or at the very least, they are doing this in places where they have been studied, like Monterey Bay, California's west coast. Their poop rapidly sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and science estimate that the giant larvation contribute up to one-third of the carbon transported to the deep sea floor of Monterey Bay. These spitballers hold the record for the most atmospheric carbon transmission to deep ocean of any plankton. And this is a good thing, we think. But we are still the biggest contributor, truly the only contributor, of plastic water bottles, plastic bags, styrofoam, soda bottles, Starbucks cups, and more. Eight billion tons of plastic every single year that we humans are responsible for. And the next time you're enjoying time at the beach, look up. Look at all those seagulls, piping plovers, other seabirds. Scientists have discovered that 90% of seabirds have plastic in their stomachs. 90%. That is 9 out of 10 birds. All of those birds. Alfred Hitchcock's field day of birds. 90%. And humans put a dump truck worth of plastic into the ocean every single minute. <laughs> The last podcast episode was 25 minutes long. That's 25 dump trucks worth of plastic into the ocean for each podcast episode of Bewilderbeasts. I think we can make that better, right? We have a lot we can learn from these larvations, these mega cool filter feeders. Sorry, my Boston is showing. Mega cool, mega cool filter feeders. I got there. They essentially take in everything and filter out what they can't use, like a strainer for pasta or a big whale taking a gulp of seawater and filtering out all the water, leaving just krill behind. Larvations, they seem relatively unharmed by the plastic, unlike literally every other animal we can think of. And while it might seem great that the plastic is being moved from the top of the sea where it attracts little animals' appetites, ooh, mosquito, wait, that's not a mosquito, as it sinks to the floor, it might start gunking up ecosystems on the floor of the ocean. Lots of bottom feeders eat larvation mucus and poop. Hey, no food shaming here. It appears that we can learn a lot about how we might be able to manage our plastic problem or overwhelmingly bad carbon problem, as we also have a lot of work to do with the choices we make in the plastics we bring into our homes, or better yet, please investigate plastic alternatives. It's easy to depend on someone else to clean up our literal trash. Have the larvation come in and clean it all up because they're so good at it, but the amount that they are pooping, even as record holders and carbon transference to the deep sea, is still our responsibility to clean up. And while we look to my new favorite word, biomimicry, 
This is a fancy schmancy word for creating technology based on real life. Like solar panels that follow the sun like a sunflower follows it. Velcro was inspired by sticky burrs or Japanese bullet trains that were inspired by the aerodynamics of bird beaks. So the biomimicry could maybe inspire creative technology to help us clean up the plastics in the oceans based on the tiny giant larvations. But it isn't enough. We can certainly use this technology, but we shouldn't depend on it. We humans, especially Americans, if we truly care about stopping a dump truck's worth of plastic every single minute going into the ocean, we should stop using one use plastics like plastic bags, straws, plastic cups, soda, water bottles, etc. We can put our energy where it needs to be, and it is hard. Look around at all the plastic in your environment. How much do you see in your room right now? So, yes, it's up to us, y'all. Save the dolphins, save the whales, save the turtles. And save the snot houses of the sea who are doing their mighty best to keep up with our choices. Did you know that in Queensland, Australia, it is illegal to own a rabbit? Unless you are a member of a very particular profession. Not veterinarian. Not agility rabbit performer. Magician. Well magician, circus, or scientific research. And when I first saw this, I laughed because, my God, that sounds so ridiculous, right? But it does turn out that there is a good reason for this ban. Rabbits are the most invasive species in Australia. They eat plants that are required for native species survival, and they box out animals who depend on the delicate ecology of Australia. Rabbits are the most destructive species in the nation. And we talked about Australian birds who use fire to start forest fires in order to catch prey. So the fact that rabbits are more destructive than starting forest fires is saying something. Rabbits cost Australians over a billion dollars in damages every single year. And while pet rabbits in the home are minimally risky to the environment, if that rabbit got out and they can breed with wild species... And they do, because rabbits, if they love anything at all, it's they love to breed. Even spayed and neutered rabbits outside can cause enough destruction to the outback that the Queensland locale said, nope, we're not risking it. And to show how serious they are, the fines for keeping a rabbit in Queensland state are $2,200 to $44,000 Australian dollars. I did the calculation. It's about $31,000, which is the equivalent of buying a brand new 2021 Mini Cooper hardtop with zero miles, leather seats, backup camera, and Bluetooth technology with $100 to spare. Go ahead. Splurge on getting that nice new car, Matt. You deserve it. My guess? is that in Queensland, Australia, there are way more magicians per capita who are able to somehow manage to get their rabbits to disappear when the authorities come around and magically appear out of a hat when they're gone. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, if you know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, please send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at Bewildered Pod, Bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and Bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Wow in the World on Mucus Mansions. Thanks, Guy. Thanks, Mindy. My daughter is a huge fan. And she's the one who recommended that I do a deep dive on this today. So thank you for the inspiration. ScienceNewsForStudents.org, EarthTouchNews.com, Cosmos Magazine, which is not the same as Cosmo Magazine, shapeoflife.org, 
dafqld.seeker.com, daf.qld.gov.au. Really, it's just like a PDF file on why Queensland is not allowed to have bunny rabbits as pets. Cars.com on the make and model and detail overview for a 2021 Mini Cooper and Mental Floss. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music, as always, is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and please share with all of your curious friends. Thanks for listening, and stay curious. I have finished recording today's episode, including takes, outtakes, and all of that fun stuff that go on behind the scenes that you usually don't see. But by the time I finished recording, I have hit 27 minutes and 15 seconds. In the process of recording just today's episode, the equivalent of 27 garbage trucks have dumped plastic into our oceans. When you can, try to look up silicone alternatives bee wax wrap, and other things that you can do to start to help help these giant larvations clean up the mess that we have left behind so we can save the turtles, the dolphins, the whales, the fish, and the birds. And maybe consider writing to your city, town, state representatives about things that they can start to do to make this plastic problem go away so it's not resting on the tiny, tiny, disgusting snot house shoulders of our giant larvation friends. Thanks.